Good morning. It's a real pleasure to be here to be able to share with you this area that we call integrative oncology. For some of you, uh, this may be a new term, but as you'll see when we get into the focus of the talk, this is something that is uh, very common, well understood, and really critically important. One of the more disturbing pieces of news that I heard last year is that cancer has now become the number one killer worldwide. This is the first time in the history of humans that cancer is the number one killer. It had previously been cardiovascular disease, and now the scales have been tipped in the area of cancer. Now, some good news, of course, and in particular for the field of melanoma, is there has been also a better understanding of cancer and some tremendous successes uh, in subpopulations of patients with melanoma, as you're going to hear uh, in the area of immunotherapy. What is also uh, troubling, but at the same time supportive, is that this increase in cancer incidence around the world, uh, a, a minimum of 50% of it can be contributed to our own lifestyle choices, in particular in the area of sedentary behavior, obesity, diet, exposure to sun, smoking, uh, and, and some other factors. So this area of integrative medicine tries to help round out the medical team at MD Anderson to be able to try and address some of these non-directly uh, medical areas of chemotherapy, radiotherapy, uh, targeted therapies and surgery. So I'm going to give you a very quick, due to the, the time limitations, overview of, of what we're doing in this area of integrative medicine and some of the evidence behind how lifestyle factors can really decrease risk of cancer and very importantly improve outcomes for those uh, diagnosed with cancer. The clinical model that we work on uh, actually is, is an old model that is not embraced well enough by the majority of healthcare system uh, in our country, which looks at health not just from the physical perspective, uh, but also looking at psycho-spiritual health and social health. So at MD Anderson, in the, in the conventional side of the street, when they're talking about physical health, we're really looking at, at the role of chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, and pharmacy, targeted therapies, immunotherapies, et cetera. Within integrative medicine, physical health to us means looking at areas of nutrition, exercise, uh, appropriate complementary modalities you're going to hear about from Dr. Garcia, like acupuncture, massage, to help control with symptoms. And then looking at these areas of sleep, environmental exposures, importantly, smoking cessation. All of this combined is really what we talk about in terms of physical health. Psycho-spiritual well-being can be conventional things such as working with our psychiatrists and psychologists, but then complementary modalities such as meditation, yoga, tai chi, to try and decrease the stress uh, that patients experience during the cancer process, and I'll describe to you why that is so important. And then the third and probably most underappreciated area is, is social well-being, making sure that individuals are appropriately socially integrated. Social support is such an important factor in our lives for helping to maintain our health. This dates back to uh, at least half a century with seminal uh, publications showing that people who are, who are better socially integrated live longer, have healthier immune system, uh, and, and decrease vulnerability to illnesses. All this is brought uh, together under the guidance of uh, two integrative oncologists who work within our centers. So these are board certified hematology oncologists who know a lot, of course, about the area of chemotherapy, but they focus on all of these other topics that I just described to you today, working together to try and achieve optimal health and healing to ultimately help to improve clinical outcomes. So within the integrative medicine program, we have both group classes as well as individual classes, uh, and the individual consultations, again, starts with meeting with an integrative oncologist, but we have 
um, a, a specific integrative medicine dietitian, exercise physiologist, acupuncturist, massage therapist, music therapist, and mind-body practitioners who work one-on-one -on -one with patients, as well as, as I mentioned, we have group classes. I won't go into all the details of, of this outside. Uh, at the break, you can pick up a brochure uh, which describes the center, has a calendar of events, describes the, the services we offer. We also work very closely with our colleagues in other areas around MD Anderson that help with issues of supportive care, such as the supportive care centers, the pain center, psychiatry, we have a fatigue center, tobacco uh, treatment center. So just briefly talking about the area of lifestyle, you see here, um, some charts from the CDC that reflect really this epidemic of obesity in our society. And this is just looking back uh, over, over 10 years. And this is something 20 years from 1990 where we see that only approximately 10 to 14% of individuals per state are classified as obese. And this isn't just being overweight. This is somebody who is more than 30 pounds overweight if they are around five foot four. Flash forward to 2010, where we see that the majority of the US is greater than 30% obese. If you take into account just being overweight, greater than 60% of our adult population are classified as obese or overweight. Well, we know this is a problem, of course, for diabetes, for cardiovascular disease. It is very clear now that this is also a risk factor for development of cancer, and very importantly, a risk factor for worse outcomes for those with cancer. And we're starting to better understand the mechanisms of how being overweight or obese can increase risk of both worse outcomes as well as risk of disease. There was just uh, earlier uh, this summer a publication that actually looked at the relationship between uh, the obesity gene and genes that are related to the risk of developing melanoma. And this overlap is quite intriguing, extremely new, but there is clearly some type of uh, of, of overlap in some of these factors. So what we do in this area of, of trying to help people with weight management, of course, is focus on diet as well as exercise to try and help people manage weight. And when we talk about diet, we have to think about it not just in terms of what's a healthy diet to lower your weight, but what's a healthy diet to improve your outcomes with cancer. And we know from the plant world that there are many anti-cancer phytochemicals in very common foods we eat. And we also know that there are potentially carcinogenic chemicals in a lot of the food that we eat. So we try and steer patients primarily to eating a plant-based diet, not to the exclusion of animal products, but the plant world is full of anti-cancer phytochemicals, a lot of which are being studied at the molecular level to see how they they can help in the fight against cancer. Some of these are, are substances that are more commonly used in Asian cuisine, such as uh, turmeric and ginger, but also things that we should all be commonly, uh, that are common to our diet that we should be eating more of, such as garlic and cabbage and broccoli, uh, the lycopene that's released from cooked tomatoes. Um, again, we can't get into all the details, but this is really what the anti-cancer plate should look like, which is primarily, again, a plant-based diet. And if you're going to be consuming animal products, that they need to be healthy animal products. Um, the area of physical activity, there is now really extensive research that supports the role of physical activity in exercise and health promotion and disease prevention. Probably no surprise to anyone in the audience. But importantly, we now know that there's a link between physical activity and our biological functioning, in particular the area of immune function. And as everyone in this audience knows, the immune system plays an extremely important role uh, in, in controlling melanoma. So this would not only help to improve outcomes that we see with many different cancer populations, the more active individuals tend to live longer, let alone, of course, living better, uh, but that this can have a, a direct biological effect. 
So of course, uh, this is all somewhat good news in that we actually know the majority of cancer could actually be prevented in the first place. There is definitely not enough focus on this area as a whole, but it is something that we try and help to encourage patients to get engaged in uh, to help improve their outcomes. The American Cancer Society has very strong statements in this area for cancer prevention with the same recommendations put forward for cancer survivors. And you can see some of these listed up here as I just uh, described to you. These not only, again, improve aspects of quality of life and will be good for the heart and good for diabetes, but they will be good to improve cancer outcomes, changing your uh, physiological functioning. This is another depiction of the plant-based diet. Again, I can't get into details of specific recommendations. Uh, I host a monthly radio show called Living the Anti-Cancer Life on our local radio station, KPFT 90.1. And actually on Monday at 9.30 a.m., I'm going to sit down with our dietitian on the air, answer questions, but essentially outline this uh, diet that you see pictured here. At least half your plate should be plants. It should be fruits, vegetables, and as you can see here, extending beyond, here this is half of essentially produce, fruits, grains, beans, legumes, nuts. All of this is the plant world with a little bit of animal protein on the side. Animal protein should be your garnish, and you should be getting most of your nutrition from the plant world. American Cancer Society, very clear that if individuals maintain healthy weight, have regular physical activity, uh, and a healthy diet, we could prevent more than 30% of cancers in this world. And for some cancers, of course, that percentage is extremely high. So very quickly, the area of stress. There is now extremely elegant research dating back over 100 years, but in particular the last decade, really understanding the role of stress at modifying our physiology and our biology. And of course, it all starts with how we process our environment, how we process stressors in our lives. And stress is not avoidable, but how we respond to it is something that we are more in control of. Extremely elegant research done here at MD Anderson by Anil Sood, as well as others around the country, have found that the stress response, which releases stress hormones, can literally get right into the tumor microenvironment and make it more hospitable to cancer. We know that chronic stress can increase angiogenesis. There are drugs, of course, developed to block angiogenesis. We know that stress can increase permeability um, of, of the vascular system, which helps for metastatic growth. We know that stress can influence specific um, cancerogenic pathways. We know that stress can literally modify gene expression, increasing inflammatory pathways, which of course is a risk uh, for cancer and worse outcomes for those diagnosed with cancer. So the area of, of stress and stress management is something that is really critically important to try uh, and manage. Some, uh, just briefly to, to conclude, some epidemiological data. Uh, this is in, as you can see, over 13,000 individuals. Essentially a, a study that looked at individuals who, were, who followed or didn't follow basic recommendations for actually heart disease, which is also an inflammatory disease, and how that impacted cancer prevention. And you can see this dose-response relationship. The more recommendations people were following, healthy weight, healthy diet, managing blood sugar, reducing cholesterol, the more that was followed, the lower the risk, as high as 51% reduced risk compared to individuals not following this. And the same is true for cancer mortality. Individuals who followed the American Institute for Cancer Research, World Cancer Research Fund guidelines, very similar to the American Cancer Society guidelines, the more guidelines you followed, the lower your risk of mortality after a diagnosis of cancer. Thank you.